All right, everybody. Hey, we're going to just pause for just one moment while we make sure that we're streaming on both of our platforms. So if you'll just bear with us, we will get started momentarily. All right. Hey, everybody. This is Jeff Martin with Magic City Books here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Thrilled to have you with us. I'm Jeff Martin. I'm the president and co-founder of the bookstore and the nonprofit Tulsa Literary Coalition, which operates the bookstore. Um, really excited to have you here tonight. This is uh, part of our weekly virtual event series, which we've been doing going on one year now. We've done well over 120 events, I believe, in that time. And it's been a really wonderful way to stay connected with all of you and kind of keep a tether of sorts to our audience, but also reach a lot of new people. I'm hoping tonight, much like many nights before, we have uh, a lot of new people joining us uh, from beyond our borders and sometimes even across the oceans. Um, so thank you for doing that. We have a lot of cool stuff coming up. Um, I won't go through the full list, but I would encourage you to go to our website. We usually do two, if not three events weekly. Um, and we're trying to make a little bit of a mixtape. Um, you know, something that's serious, maybe followed by something that's a little bit more light and uh, trying to give you that ebb and flow uh, that that, uh, that, you're, that you deserve and that you're used to. So stay tuned, that's what I will say. Got a big announcement this week. So if you follow us on social media, I would say we're announcing what I would say is probably one of our biggest, if not the biggest author event guest that we've ever had. And we've had some pretty big ones over the years. So stay tuned, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all those places. Um, tonight is going to be really exciting because, you know, we don't do as much stuff in this space that we're going to be talking about tonight as, as I wish we did, but this is going to be a really cool opportunity to bring not just one, but two, I think, of, you know, the world's great thinkers together for a conversation uh, that's really going to be special. And I'm excited to not have to uh, moderated. I'm going to get this be joining you guys watching this and, and taking notes and listening and, and doing all of that. Um, but I'll begin by introducing our, our moderator. Um, you, you probably know him well on his work, but Adam Grant is an organizational psychologist at the Wharton School at Penn. Um, you've probably been one of the millions and millions of people who've watched his TED Talks, uh, read his books, number one best-selling books, you know, most recently Think Again, you know, and, um, you know, if you know Adam's work, as many of you do, you know that you're always in for a treat when he starts to kind of explain our world to us in, in, in the special way that he does. So really thrilled to have Adam joining us. But our, our reason for being here tonight is uh, really thought-provoking and strangely timely new book called The Data Detective by Tim Harford. And, you know, and, and The Data Detective is um, one of those books that comes along in a strange moment in this year where we've probably been buried in statistics, at least for us layman people, more than ever before, you know, looking at vaccine data and, and, and looking at positivity rates and all the kind of statistics that we've been um, confronted with in this COVID-19 age. And so having a book that looks at statistics and um, tries to make them not just palatable, but kind of opens a new door into the way you see the world around you through statistics is pretty special. If you don't know Tim's work, can't encourage you anymore to listen to his wonderful podcast, Cautionary Tales, um, read his previous work like uh, Messy 50 Inventions That Shape the Modern Economy. Um, so having Tim and Adam together tonight, really special. We have their books easily accessible. If you go to the chat function here, you can buy Data Detective, you can get a copy of Think Again. You can uh, get a two for two for the price of two special tonight. They were only running for one night only. So take advantage of that. Um, and hopefully you'll have some questions. Uh, there's gonna be a lot talked about here and, and I'm sure it will be thought provoking. And if you have a question for Adam, for Tim, please put that into the Q&A and Adam will uh, get to some of those either through the conversation or perhaps toward the end. So please do dump those questions in there. So without any further ado, I'm ready to sit back, relax, and watch this fascinating conversation with our very special guests, Adam Grant and Tim Harford. Welcome and thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And Tim, so we meet again. <laughs> it's great to see you, Adam. Thank, thank you so much because Think Again has deservedly done incredibly well. You must be so much in demand and you've taken time out to sit with me for another conversation. So I'm, I'm 
super grateful. Thank you. <laughs> That's overly kind of you. I'm thrilled to do this. Uh, I, when we talked last month, of course, you were in charge. So I'm, I just could not be more overjoyed that I have the reins this time. Yeah, um, okay. Um, that, that, you're making me feel nervous already, but uh, it's a good kind of nervous. So. Uh, let, me, let me just start by saying it's, it's just extraordinary to see how much you've, you've accomplished during this pandemic. <laughs> you've, you've released another epic podcast season. You've published an incredible book that I think we all need to read because we all need to get better at using data in our lives and understanding the data in the world. Um, I know in the past also, you were a debate champion, you've been an undercover economist, a hit TED talker. What haven't you done? Uh, well, I mean, I haven't been a frontline care, work, care worker. That's, that's one thing, although I, apparently I, I get defined as a key worker because of the public service journalism. But I was, I was thinking about this because uh, a friend of mine who's, um, who's a doctor, who's been absolutely on the front lines of the pandemic, he's had COVID, his wife, who's a doctor, she's had COVID. Uh, they've been trying to keep it all together. But, and, and every time I see him for our socially distanced walks or cycle rides, he's always in, in a great mood. And he sent me a message. This made me think of you, Adam, because it's, it, was, it just seemed to be superhuman empathy he was, he was demonstrating, which is the kind of thing you always advocate. He sent me a message and he said, I've just been thinking, Tim, you must have had a really difficult year. Everything's changed for you and you don't get to see your friends. And uh, it's easy for me because I just drive into work and I see my colleagues and it's fine. Um, but, but well done, you must have had a hard time. And I thought, this is, you know, there are people who feel very sorry for themselves and who think that like the, the whole world has it better. And this was just a demonstration of the absolute, absolute opposite. So yeah, anyway. That is a beautiful thing. It sounds like the, the reverse of schadenfreude in some yeah. ways. Is that, there must be a word for that. I'm not sure what it is. There should be, and it's probably German, which I don't speak. But I, um, I have to tell you, so I love the data de detective. It's, it's a topic that I think vexes us all. Uh, and you make it, you just take all the complexities of numbers and you make them make sense, which is such a rare gift and a timely gift too. I do have to tell you though, Tim, that there was a part of this book that, that bothered me at my core. Oh no. I, I've, I've admired Florence Nightingale since I was a kid. Uh, I've, I admire her so much, in fact, that I married someone who followed in her footsteps. Uh, you may not know this, but my wife, Allison, has not one, not two, but three degrees in nursing. And here I you are telling me that I need to rethink my adulation of Florence Nightingale. What is going on there? And can you rescue her legacy, please? Oh, I mean, no, you don't need to rethink your adulation of Florence Nightingale. She, she is really an absolutely remarkable person. And she achieved great things, not just as a nurse, but also as an educator of nurses. Um, but what I was discussing in The Data Detective was her work uh, both as a statistician and as a science communicator and as a, as a public health advocate and how those three things, the, the statistician, the science communication and the public health advocacy, how they all fit together. Of course, the, there is this, the sting in the tail, which is maybe some of the science communication you know, ranged a little bit towards the advocacy and a little bit away from the statistics. But I mean, I'm, we're setting the bar very high there. I mean, was that the thing that bothered you, Adam? Yeah, it was, it was just the idea that in, you know, in all this work that she did to, you know, to make a generation and a field healthier and safer, she, you know, she might have been manipulating some numbers or at least letting some data fallacies slide that she was fully aware of. So can you walk us through what happened there and what we can learn from that story? Yeah, I think I would not put it quite so harshly as that. She, there's this, there's this famous, um, thing that gets said by all of Nightingale's biographers uh, about uh, this letter she received from William Farr, the great statistician. Um, William Farr said, oh, you, statistics should be the driest of all reading. And I discovered in researching the data detective that actually got it the wrong way around. Florence Nightingale was the one who sent him, and he's this big sort of beardy Victorian gentleman. You can picture him now. He kind of looks like Darwin and all the others. She sent him that letter. And some, somewhere the, the historical record got mixed up. So she was telling him to keep it dry. 
So she was absolutely committed to really, really rigorous uh, work on the statistics and to making sure that they were unimpeachable and could not be criticized. But she was so, so clever in the way that she communicated. And the fundamental idea that was controversial at the time, it seems crazy now, was uh, ventilation was a good idea. Public health was a good idea. It was a good idea to, for example, not have a dead horse in the water supply, which is what there was in one of the hospitals that she was, she was in charge of. Um, and she was advocating, look, we need much better standards of public health. And the whole British military and medical establishment was against this. And Nightingale was incredibly influential, but you know, she's just one person, she's a woman in a man's world. And so the weapon she brought to that argument was a very clever pie chart. And what's clever about this chart, which is called the Rose Diagram, um, you, can, you could Google it later, Florence Nightingale Rose Diagram. What's clever about it is the way it breaks the data up in a very specific way and turns it into a before and after story. So there are these two spirals, one of just deaths increasing and increasing and increasing, and it's awful, and these men are, oh, it's just appalling, and it really was appalling. And then they clean up the hospitals, and then the deaths go down and down and down, and it's this amazing story of, of catastrophe and redemption. And actually, the, th you know, the thing I hate to admit is when you plot that data in a more straightforward way, uh, it doesn't have quite the same before and after structure. But you know, there are lots of people we respect, Adam, who, who break their graphs up in clever ways in order to make the signal in the data seem a little bit stronger. So she's not the only one. Okay, so at the end of the day, we're supporting her legacy and we're honoring her contribution. What we're saying is she uh, transformed the public health of the entire British empire. Uh, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people lived longer healthier lives as a result of Florence Nightingale. But on the other hand, maybe it was a slightly, slightly naughty pie chart. So, you know, you can, you can weigh up in the balance. I mean, I'm, what I'm sensing from you, Adam, is that the pie chart is really weighing on your conscience now and you're not sure you can forgive her from it. Well, that, that's exactly where I'm, I'm struggling is asking in this case, do the moral ends justify the maybe statistically slippery means? Where did you yeah. come down on that, Tim? Um, I'm not sure I really uh, have fully resolved my own feelings. Actually, reading Think Again helped me understand that because there, you talk and think again about this idea that people can be preachers or people can be politicians um, or they can be scientists. And I think what's impressive about Nightingale is that she was a scientist first and then she was a, a preacher and a politician. And having nailed down exactly what she thought the facts were, at that point, she went into the full on, uh, I'm not sure whether it was full on preacher or full on politician mode, but whatever it is, it got results. And maybe that's okay. I mean, maybe having decided that you've examined it, the, the data from every possible angle, you've been really rigorous. Uh, and there were a lot of problems with the data that she fixed and her colleagues fixed. Once you've done that, at a certain point, you have to start convincing people. If, if they, they don't wanna be convinced, you bring the data. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, the other, the other story that has really stuck with me from the book is Vermeer. And mm -hmm. I wondered if you could just give us the highlights of, of that story and then the lesson that we all need to take from it. So that story begins with a gentleman called Abraham Bradius, who was one of the, the leading art critics in the world in the 1930s. And, and at that time, he was an old man in semi-retirement and a, a charming lawyer called Gerard Bone, who was a pillar of the Dutch establishment, brought to him this amazing picture with an amazing story going alongside it. And the picture appeared to be a lost masterpiece of Johannes Vermeer. It even you know, had the, the signature in the corner. And uh, Bradius just completely just got, just got carried away. In fact, he said, when I saw this work, I had difficulty controlling my emotion. And you can see where this, this is going, right? It wasn't a Vermeer, of course it wasn't a Vermeer. But the thing is, it wasn't even a very good painting. There's this, there's this one bit in the painting where there's this, um, it's a picture of uh, Christ with the disciples having supper at Emmaus. And one of the disciples has his arm on a table and it kind of looks like a comedy arm that's been severed from the body. It doesn't quite like one of those joke handshake arms that you shake the hands and they come off. 
So it's not even a great uh, picture. So how is it that this great expert managed to fool himself? That's what really interested me. Um, and that story goes into all kinds of really strange and quite dark places. The, the, the Nazis are involved and there's a master forger and he's, he's like a hero. And then he's a, we realize he's actually a terrible villain. He's not a hero at all. It's an amazing story. But the, the, the key point was you can be the leading expert in the world and you can get it wrong if your emotions get, carry you away. And the point I make, I've got these 10 rules for thinking differently about numbers throughout the book. And rule number one is to, to search your feelings. If I can quote The Empire Strikes Back. Just notice your emotional reaction to a number, because if the number is producing an emotional reaction, whether it's joy or vindication, or you feel afraid, or you're in denial, whatever the emotion is, that's not helping you think clearly. And if you can calm down for a second and then just go back and look at the number again, immediately you start to see, is it solid or is there a problem? Uh, one, one of my favorite things about that recommendation to search your feelings is now, whenever I look at data, the first thing I hear is, <laughs> search your feelings, Luke. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it immediately sticks. So that, I think it's, it's a helpful rhetorical device. Uh, uh, I, think, I think any rule should be given in the voice of Darth Vader, just for added gravitas. I, I will say anytime James Earl Jones is available and wants to record other rules from the book, I, I think that could, could be a great contribution. But uh, Tim, I, I thought one of the, the more poignant moments was when you said, look, I, 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 I'm not immune to this. Uh, and you had an example of, of tweeting something that turned out to be flawed. Uh, yeah. How have, talk to us about those kinds of moments and how you've learned to catch yourself once you do search your feelings. Yeah, it, it's almost like a habit of mind. I mean, I'm phrasing this as these are the 10 commandments, but they're not, they're not really commandments. They're, you know, these are habits you should try and get into. And so that habit of before you, you retweet or share, of going, hang on a minute, let me just look at that again. Um, I mean, I'm quite struck now, Twitter has got this functionality, they've just introduced this function where um, you retweet something without having read the article and it says, do you want to read the article first? And I've been surprised how often I find myself, because I see, oh, this is by a colleague of mine at the Financial Times, looks really interesting, I'll just retweet it and then I'll read the article. And Twitter's like, really? Are you sure you want to do that? Yeah, that's a good, it's a good reminder. So I, I, you know, I need help. But this particular example, was um, it was a graph showing uh, increasing support for same-sex marriage in the United States. And I feel really strongly about this. I think it's, a, it's great that support is increasing. Um, I, was, so I was a member of the, um, I, I taught in Ireland when I was really young. I taught at a university in Ireland and I joined the lesbian and gay support group uh, on you know, my first day in, in Ireland. And um, the, the, the student said, um, uh, I, I said to the student, do you have to be gay to join the lesbian and gay support group? And the students said, uh, no. I said, okay, well, I support you, so join, join me up. And he, and he, he said, you're not from around here, are you? Um, and, um, but, you know, I, I felt strongly about this for a very long time. Um, long after that, my sister came out. She's married to a woman. This is really important to me. And I saw this graph and I, and I thought, great, great news. I want to share to my 180,000 followers, the great news about this, click retweet. And the very first response was, uh, Tim, have you looked at the axes on that graph? And of course, the moment I saw the response, I thought, oh no. And I looked and it, the whole thing was just a mess. I should just have clipped it for my bad data visualization file. But I didn't because in that moment, I had an emotional reaction and boom, just, just click, yeah, just click, share, spread the word. And I didn't think for a second. Um, and I, I do describe it as a sort of reflex or a habit. I still make that mistake, but less often because I just, I, I can hear, hear my own kind of, I can feel my own emotional reaction. And this little voice in my head going, ah, you're, you're having feelings now. And feelings are fine, but uh, you know, have the feelings. And then when you've had them, then decide whether to share or not. One of the things I like to do in a situation like that is to reverse it and say, if, if this graph showed the opposite effect, would I still share it? 
Yeah. And if the answer is no, then I need to be very suspicious of my own motivations. Yeah, it's a great piece of advice. I love that these reversals work really well uh, in many circumstances. So I can't remember whether I described one in the book, but the idea of when, you, when you've encountered a really cool, um, really cool study in psychology. I mean, just to name one particular social science, you've encountered a really cool study in psychology. And then along comes the bigger study that fails to replicate the first study. And just that, it's called the time reversal heuristic. Like, would anybody be talking about the little study if the big study that found no effect had come out first? So it's always worth asking these questions. Definitely. Uh, one of the things that your book made me think a lot about was education. Uh, I, I'm not sure what your, your current frustrations are in the UK, but the US version of this that, that just has been eating away at me since I finished reading The Data Detective is, why in the world do we force kids to learn ge geometry but not statistics? Uh, yeah. <laughs> if, if you think about the comparative utility of, of those two areas of education, I don't even think it's close. Yeah. What are your thoughts on what we ought to be doing to teach kids to make sense of numbers? So I've thought about this a lot, and I'm going to be thinking about this a lot more because I'm, I'm starting to ponder whether I should write a version of this book for younger readers. Um, so any ideas you have on that line, Adam, are very welcome. But I do think it's important. And part of the, the point is, actually, this stuff is not that hard. Uh, it, it's, it's more about wisdom than about deep, deep expertise. Remember the story of Abraham Bradius? You know, he was the smartest guy in the world, and he still fooled himself. So a lot of this stuff is not so hard. Um, so what should we do in schools? I don't want to be that guy who, you can be that guy, Adam, because you're in the education system. So you can say things like, oh, the students who come to me, they haven't been prepared by the schools in this way or that way. And I think we should make changes. Whereas I'm just a writer. I'm a journalist. I'm not in the education system. So I don't want to be that guy who's like, oh, kids should learn this, kids should learn that, teachers should do this. It's very easy to say that. Um, but that said, I do think there's an opportunity to embed statistics throughout the curriculum. And it's this kind of critical thinking and reasoning and you know, learning, for example, to rethink, learning to see the emotional content of messages, learning to answer really simple questions, uh, such as, is this a big number or a small number? Is this number going up or down? All of that stuff doesn't have to be in math class. You can learn that in chemistry or uh, geography. Uh, or English. I mean, there, there are people who, who break down the number of times the word he or the word she is used in The Hobbit, which is a very interesting comparison, actually. Um, you can do all this stuff, you can spread it throughout the curriculum, and it makes the statistics seem more relevant, and I think it, it strengthens the other subjects as well. So having thought about this a lot and talked to people who know more about it than I do, that's, that's where I see the, the opportunity. I mean, is there, are there one or two things that you would really like to, to see? And surely you don't really want geometry to be canceled, do you, Adam? I mean, trigonometry could go, right? Okay, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> but, um, you know, I'm, I'm honestly, I'm a little bit torn on some aspects of this. So let's, let's talk about data literacy for a second as, you know, as a skill to teach not only kids, but also adults too. Mm -hmm. I, I remember the, uh, you, you cited some Gerd Gigerenzo research in the book, and I remember being shocked by an experiment he did showing that people were more influenced by statistics if instead of giving people a percentage, you just gave them a natural frequency. Yeah. So, you know, in, instead of, um, you know, instead of 12% of people will experience the following side effects, 12 in 100 people will experience this, the following side effects. How in the world could those be different statements? They're the exact same numbers. Yeah. And my first thought was, well, we should, you know, we should be converting everything because people don't intuitively understand percentages the same way they do, you know, ratios. Uh, but then I thought, no, we just, we need to teach people the basic literacy to make sense of a percentage. Yeah. And I would, I would love to see that kind of education, right? The, 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 the gigarenzer effect there should be, that should vanish as a result of the things we learn in school. Uh, it would yeah, be one, I, one reaction. That's an interesting thought. So I, I, I sympathize. Yeah. I mean, 12% is the same as 12 and a hundred, right? Everyone should know that. And the fact that they don't know that is, feels like a, a you know, a gap in people's education that we can fill. Uh, on the other hand, percentages are really tricky. So, I mean, it, if I'm getting 1% on my savings account and it goes up to 2%, so has the, has the rate on my savings account gone up 1% or has it gone up 100%? 
I mean, it's I, gone I, up one hundred percent, but one percentage point, percentage right? Point. Yeah, yeah. That's the <laughs> that is the formally correct answer. Like you would, but somebody who said, "Oh, it's gone up one percent," you wouldn't say, "No, that's wrong. That's wrong." You'd say, "Well, you know, you could." Well, phrase I, that I probably clearly. would, but I would be a very annoying conversation partner, and they wouldn't want to talk to me anymore. Yeah. But you know, percentages are hard, and and they and you come up with this sort of thing, this sort of problem or lack of clarity or lack of definition, like percent of what that comes up a lot. And so to do it Gigerenza's way, I think does, does help people. And you can, you can, and there's extra information that gets embedded when you speak in natural frequencies. So say you say, for example, um, if you have bacon uh, every day for breakfast, it raises your risk of bowel cancer by about uh, 20%, which I think, I think is about right. Now, the, the actual numbers, I could have the actual numbers wrong, but it, it's something like uh, the chance of bowel cancer is uh, five in 200 without the bacon, and it goes up to six in 200 with the bacon. So you've got 200 people not eating bacon and five of them will develop bowel cancer. And if they all start eating bacon, then one additional person will develop bowel cancer and five would have got bowel cancer anyway. Now. You can say, oh, yeah, you can do all that with percentages. But actually, I, I do feel there's a really natural, intuitive piece of way of framing the information that, that, that's happened there. That's a very good point. All right. I think you've, you've changed my mind in favor of natural frequencies now, uh, oh. which is not something I expected. Yeah. So, the, great thing, the great thing, Adam, is having written a book called Think Again, like, I can say anything I like and you have to say, oh, yeah, you maybe changed my mind because you, you have to sort of model that kind of virtue you're it's, it's great you're so wrong about that tim i could just say you need to rethink that wouldn't wouldn't you want to follow the principles of my book uh but let me let me ask you another question here which is actually let me first just say to our live audience i'm going to be taking your questions shortly so feel free to submit them in the q a tab if you haven't already uh tim i i I'm, I'm struck by something that you highlight at the end of the book, which also caught me off guard. I thought it was fascinating and counterintuitive. You said that misinformation can be beautiful. Mm -hmm. And this obviously goes against the, the crusade that I think is, is going on in many areas of, of the data detective world, right? Which is, we're trying to eliminate misinformation. Uh, we're trying to prevent it from, you know, from slipping into people's minds and being trusted when it shouldn't be. Why in the world is misinformation potentially a beautiful thing? So this is the thing that we, you know, we're, we're told all the time that you shouldn't judge a book by its cover. You shouldn't judge people by their appearances. You know, people who look really beautiful can be nasty people on the inside. People who look unattractive by conventional standards, they can be beautiful people on the inside. Well, the same thing is true for graphs. So when I say misinformation can be beautiful, I'm not saying it's good. I'm saying you can have a terrible graph that is completely misleading and it can look just as pretty as a graph that has really solid data. And the various examples I, I discuss in the book, uh, there's one that I, I really like, and it's by a designer I admire a lot, David McCandless. So I do like his work uh, and I kind of feel bad because I criticized him and then I met him and you know, there's always a reminder to, you should say things to people's faces. But um, he did this fantastic, fantastic uh, presentation of different financial amounts. Like, this is the amount of money that was spent bailing out the banks during the financial crisis. This is what they spent on the Iraq war. So there's a lot of kind of, you know, the emotions are riding high. These are politically sensitive numbers. Oh, this is how much they spend on debt relief to Africa. It's tiny. This is the America's credit card bill. And the whole thing is, these blocks falling, it's a YouTube video. And it, it's, like, uh, it's like Tetris, it's like the old computer game. And it's got the music like Tetris and, like, doo, 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 and, and it's great, it's so, so good. And the only problem is all the data behind it is junk. And I know it's junk because David being an ethical person has listed all of his sources. So I can go and I can look at all the sources. And I, you know, it's stuff like, oh, one newspaper said that some guy said that you know, there's, there's this number. So like, there's a number behind you know, every quantity on the graph, but he's compared stocks with flows, which is like, you know, that's com like comparing your mortgage with your monthly mortgage payment. It's not the same thing. Yeah? Um, he's compared um, like net uh, amounts with gross amounts. He's compared, uh, oh, like this is all of the costs of the Iraq war 
uh, versus this is what the Defense Department said they would spend on the, on the Iraq war. Well, that's not a before and after comparison. That's like a really narrow definition of the cost of the war, and that's this is a really broad definition. And, and it's still a beautiful, beautiful graph. And so the argument I want people to understand is um, actually the, the more beautiful the graph, the more you should be careful and you should be saying, well, hang on, you know, what are the sources? What's not being plotted on this graph? What are the definitions? All of the questions that you should ask of any number, you should be asking them you know, twice as hard. Can you ask a question twice as hard? I don't know, but you should be asking those questions with, with renewed vigor when they come with a pretty graph. Uh, we, I mean, we, there's some, some data I saw that suggested that you can form an impression of a graph within uh, half a second, 500 milliseconds. And you just, of course, you can't see the, the axes, you don't know anything about the graph, you don't know what the subject is, but you could look at it and you either go, that's a mess, or you go, shiny, and you've got that impression, and you need to shake it and have a look at the underlying data before you, before you share it or retweet it or believe any of it. Yes, please. And that is a great segue to our first audience question, which is, what are the most common ways that dig data visualization is used to distort or hide what the data actually say? So I think the simplest way is uh, that, the, you know, the data underlying the graph are no good. I mean, it's, it's that simple. But you, you've got a beautiful uh, plot of, uh, say, you know, data on COVID cases from a country that's not doing much testing. And then you're, you know, you're testing data are junk. And so your beautiful graph of COVID cases is, is no good. So this sort of thing happens a lot. And um, I mean, what, there, there are various pieces of advice throughout the book, for example, that you should always be asking yourself, what is actually being measured here? How do they actually count this? Or how do they measure this? Um, before you start slicing and dicing the numbers. Well, the same thing applies to a, to a graphic. If you don't fully understand what's being measured, uh, if you're conf con confusing, for example, the debt and the deficit, like the debt is the total amount that's being borrowed, the deficit is the amount that's being borrowed each year. If you're confusing those two things or the person plotting the graph is confusing those two things, it doesn't matter how accurate the graph is, you've, you've completely fooled yourself. Okay, next audience question is, if you could help the American voting public understand one aspect of statistics, what would it be? Uh, I, is it a big number or a small number? Uh, I mean, if I had to, and there are different things that I would like people to understand, but the simplest thing is um, just trying to understand the size of, of the number. And there's an idea in the book that, that, I, um, that I call landmark numbers. So that's just comparing a quantity to another quantity. So if you know, for example, what the defense budget is of the United States, or you know the population of the United States, um, or you know the entire government spending in the United States, or you know how many people die in the United States every day on a normal day. These sorts of, they're sort of weird numbers to carry around in your head, but if you have a few numbers like this, in your head, or you can Google them, and you know it's it's not hard. Um, we've got these supercomputers we carry around in our pockets, so you don't need to carry them around in your head anymore. If you have those landmark numbers, you can easily make these uh, these comparisons, and you can ask yourself, is this a big number or a small number? And the point is, this isn't actually very difficult. It doesn't require lots of statistical knowledge, uh, a little bit of mental arithmetic, or you know you can use a calculator and you can very quickly clarify what's being said. Um, I'll give, give you an example. I was, uh, so in my own country, the UK, the, um, the politician in charge of the health system said last summer, uh, if everybody in the UK who's overweight lost five pounds, then the, the National Health Service, our, our health system, would save 100 million pounds, which is about $150 million. And everyone emailed me and they said, because I've, I do kind of data fact checking a lot in the British media. So loads of people emailed me and said, is it true? How does he know this? What studies did he do? And my response was, well, I don't, you know, I don't know if it's true. I don't know how he knows it. I don't know what studies he did, but I do know that I can do the math on that. So he said 100 would save 100 million pounds uh, over five years, he actually said. 
So that's 20 million pounds a year. And the population of the country is more than 60 million. So he's actually talking about saving 30 pence a year per person, or about 50 cents per person per year. So he's saying if everybody in the country lost some weight, the, the healthcare system would save 50 cents per person. Like that's not difficult maths. You, know, you just need a, a calculator, back of the envelope, you can do it in your head. And as long as we have those sorts of numbers around and the confidence to know I can do that kind of math, that's not actually hard. If we have that confidence, you can very quickly make sense of numbers. And these sort of ideas of, is it big, is it small, is it going up or is it going down? They're really fundamental questions to understand about numbers that matter a lot more than a lot of the, the fine technical detail. Well, speaking of counting, you left us with this tantalizing observation earlier that you could count the, the gender pronouns in The Hobbit. <laughs> What, what, what's the backstory there? Is, um, are, are, we, are we to think that Tolkien was sexist or at least uh, using too many male characters? Uh, he, he had a lot of male characters. I was, I was actually challenged uh, on uh, live radio to, to figure this out. And I said to my, because I, I, I'm trying to remember the name, I feel bad because I can't remember the name of the, the person who did it, but the, the book he wrote, was called something like Nabokov's favorite color is mauve. And it's all about, a, it's a mathematical analysis of, of all sorts of works of literature. Um, but I thought to myself, well, okay, how often is the word he used in The Hobbit? I'm guessing the word he is probably used, I don't know, every 50 words, maybe? There's a sentence with he in, and it's a, it's a nice fat book, so maybe it's 100,000 words. So divide 100,000 by, 50, it's, the word he's probably used 2,000 times. Uh, and at which point the author was, oh yeah, it is actually like, it's about 2,000 times. So you can do these mental, uh, the mental arithmetic. Then the harder question is how, how often is the word she used? And you know, because the, the question's been asked that the answer's not good, right? And I was thinking, I couldn't think of a single female character. So I actually said, I think the answer is probably zero. And I was wrong. The answer is one. The word she is used once to refer to Bilbo Baggins's mother. And that's it. So, uh, you know, you can draw your own conclusions about Tolkien, but that's the data. And, wow. You know, there you go. Another fascinating question from the audience is, you know, I, I imagine a lot of the people with us tonight are data geeks uh, who, like us, love numbers and statistics. Oh, we're with friends. Excellent. I, I, I can only assume. Uh, I, I can't imagine that many people who are numerically averse showing up for a data detective talk, but you never know. The, the question is, though, for, for people who might be a little bit less comfortable with numbers or even averse to st statistics, Sometimes they shut down when you bring numbers or facts into the conversation that are that are based on some kind of quantifiable metric. How do you recommend communicating about statistics with an audience that's not well versed in them? So the, the first thing, and this is probably the last thing as well, is to wake, awaken people's sense of curiosity. So like there's something about the world that you would like to know about, right? That you're curious about, hopefully there's some gap in your knowledge. And my claim is that very often the statistics can help us fill that gap in our knowledge. They're, they're like, um, like radar. You know, you've got all of these things buzzing around out there, you know, that whether they're planes or whether they're uh, cases of, of COVID, whatever they are, there are all these things out there. And statistics are like the radar that lets you see what's going on, scope out the landscape, see threats, see opportunities, know where to place your resources, you just know what's going on. And there are things you can't understand about the world uh, without statistics. That's the basic argument. And so I would just appeal to someone's curiosity. What is, what is it that you would like to know about? And let's see how the data can help. That's, that's the starting point. And then it's all about, you know, where, where did these numbers come from? How were they gathered? Like who, how were the statisticians, that, you know, who, collected this fact about um, homelessness or this fact about immigration or this fact about sporting participation. How did they actually do it? What questions were they asking? Who were they talking to? Those are the sorts of approaches that, that I favor. 
because then you realize there's nothing kind of magical about this stuff. But fundamentally, it's about people trying to count or measure stuff. Uh, you know, Sesame Street, the count, you know, one, up, 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 two, up. By the way, highlight of my journalistic career, I got to interview the count once, which was, was a very special moment. But yes, that's you know, moving beyond those numbers and saying, what is, this, what is it about the world that the numbers can help us understand? Well, you, I thought you were going to go in a different direction on that question, which is mm -hmm. I thought you were going to talk about storytelling because it is something you do masterfully. Uh, I've, I've heard you do it on the TED stage, on Cautionary Tales. I've read it in your columns and in your books. And you know, that, I guess that's what, what hooks me into the curiosity. Yep. At, at some level, it, I, I felt when I was reading The Data Detective, like the, the title was perfect in, in a sense that I hadn't thought of when I picked it up, which is it reads like a Sir Arthur Conan Doyle novel. Like when you, when you tell the story about, uh, about trying to figure out whether the Vermeer is a fake or not and all the twists and turns it takes, like this is exactly, you, you are doing what Sherlock Holmes does. And so you're, you know, you're, you're not only teaching us to be data detectives, but you tell the story of what it's like to be a data detective um, in your own mind in a way that just is gripping. And I wondered if you could talk to us a little bit about how you, how you do that. When, when you decide you're gonna cover a story, whether it's a, you know, a, a questionable Vermeer or a Florence Nightingale twist, uh, where do you begin? How do you put the data and the facts together? And then how do you make the story sing? Yeah, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a very nice thing to say, by the way, Adam, thank you very much. It's the nicest thing anyone said to me since probably the last conversation I had with my nine-year-old son who <laughs> currently thinks I'm awesome. So that's, I'm gonna hold on to that while it lasts. Um, yeah, I mean, the storytelling is, is that, that's part of the curiosity, right? The story, a good story awakens that sense of curiosity and then in the end satisfies it. So I suppose, yeah, uh, the stories are really important. So how do I do that? Um, well, it's, I mean, it's a challenge, it's hard and I like it because it's hard. Uh, and I tell more stories in more recent books than I used to in my earlier books because I just, I just, I love reading stories and I love finding stories and I love trying to tell them. So sometimes I'm going out and I'm, I'm trying to collect stories. So I, I'm reading uh, works of history, works of biography. I'm listening to podcasts and I'm on the, I'm on the lookout for an inter interesting story that seems to have a moral there. That the, and perhaps the moral has not been fully explored because you know, there's also my geek antenna that's going out. There's a... Um, there's, a, there's an economics point in there, or there's a point about safety engineering in there that hasn't been fully explored. So partly it's that, it's looking, looking out there for stories in the wild. And then sometimes there's a particular point in social science or a particular point in statistics or in economics uh, that I'm thinking, I'd really, it'd be great to get a really, really good example of this. And then sometimes with that in mind, the story comes along. So you can sort of, you can drill from either end of the tunnel and, and then you sort of try and, try and make it meet up. And of course, I've got an editor who's very honest with me who will say, oh, that's a really nice story, Tim, but it doesn't really make the point you want to make. Like, no, no, the story must fit. But, you know, you, you wrestle with that. And, uh, and, it's, and it's great fun. It's great fun. A journey of discovery. It shows. One of the other things that jumped out at me in the book was you said, and I'm going to quote you here, Avoid premature enumeration. Mm, it's a what problem is I have. That and yeah. why and how? So, so premature enumeration. Um, so I often, often have this, this issue with my wife. Uh, so let me explain. Uh, we'll, we'll be listening to the radio in the morning and somebody on the morning news program, there'll be some factual claim, some statistic. And she will turn to me because she's still got this mental model, because as I say, I do all this nerdy statistical work on, on, on uh, UK radio. She'll turn to me and she'll say, is that true, Tim? She's got this idea that I've got this huge list of facts in my head uh, that I can just check off, like, no, that's true, that's not true, that's true. And, and of course, I, I usually don't know. But what I will very often say to her is, well, I don't know, because I don't know what they mean by whatever it is. They'll say, oh, um, uh, oh, uh, violent video games uh, cause violence. And you go, okay, right, that sounds interesting. That sounds like it, it's a thing that could be true. They've done this study and they've proven that violent video games cause violence. So, uh, okay, what do you mean by a violent video game? And 
Like what's the mechanism by which they cause violence? Is it like somebody who plays it for hours and hours for a year? Or is it someone who goes into a lab and plays it for 10 minutes? And like, and is Pac-Man a violent video game? Because Pac-Man, he just sort of chases people around. He eats sentient creatures whole. I mean, there's a cannibalism thing going on. It's horrific. Um, but maybe Pac-Man isn't what they had in mind. And then when you say causes violence, is that like somebody filled in a questionnaire and, and were kind of more aggressive in, their, in, in that? Or, or they, they got into trouble with the police? Like, what is it there that's being measured? And I can imagine one model in which there's a very neatly controlled experiment in a lab that's all quite, doesn't feel very real worldly, but it's a proper solid randomized trial. Or there could be some study in the world that's kind of much more realistic, but at the same time, much less well controlled. You haven't been able to randomize, you just kind of observationally studied some kids and you said, well, you know, these kids who got in trouble with the police, they also play violent video games, but did did the video games cause the trouble with the police? But the point of all of this is you don't understand anything until you understand what is meant by a violent video game, by causes violence, by plays a game, all of these things. And so often we, we hear these stories presented and the soundbite just isn't, doesn't give us the information we need. And it's not just about, oh, I don't have the information I need to reach a conclusion. It's also that it gets back to the storytelling. Like, Something, maybe something really interesting just happened, but you're not telling me any of the interesting stuff. So now I really want to know more and I want to go deeper. So that's what I'm always trying to do. You need to understand what's being measured, what's being counted, what the definitions are. It's so easy for us to fool ourselves because we leap to a conclusion and and we're wrong. Now, increasingly, this number crunching is not being done by humans, right? It's being done by computer algorithms. And I think we're moving toward, toward a world where that's more and more true. Uh, You give some guidance in the book about how we can deal with algorithms that are spitting out data and statistics. Uh, Walk us through what the highlights are and whether there's a hope for those of us who want to have number crunching jobs in the future. So I think the the wisest perspective on this actually comes from a 17th century monk. Uh, uh, Yeah, why not? Uh, Marin Mersenne, who was also a mathematician and became known as the post box of Europe because he became the center of collaboration between scientists asking questions, trying to understand the world all over Europe. They would send their letters to Mersenne and he'd copy them out and he'd he'd make copies and send them back out to people. Uh, And he was establishing this norm uh, that science is about uh, transparency, sharing of results, the public demonstration of experiments, the replication of other people's experiments. So not necessarily cooperation as such, but a sort of maybe competition, but whatever was going on, it's going on in the open. And that's what science is is about. And it contrasts really interestingly with alchemy. And we think of alchemy as like, oh, it's these idiots trying to turn lead into gold. But actually the alchemists were often the same people as the scientists, people like Isaac Newton, they're using the same methods, so that they're using experimentation. Um, so what's different? And the answer is, it's all secret. You don't want, if you figure out how to turn lead into gold, you don't want everyone else to know, right? This is the problem. And so there's these letters between uh, Newton and, uh, and uh, Hooke, I think it was, well, possibly Boyle, these great scientists, with Newton going, oh, maintain high silence. Don't tell anybody about the alchemical experiments. And so they made no progress because they would be constantly thinking, oh, maybe somebody else has figured out how to turn lead into gold or discovered the elixir of eternal life and the knowledge has been lost. Just, they went nowhere. So this is how important transparency and this kind of competitive collaboration, replication, sharing of data, it's how important it is. Okay. But you asked me about algorithms. So what's this got to do with algorithms? Well, think about the way that you know, Google's algorithms and Facebook's algorithms and all these, the, the algorithms that decide whether people go to jail or don't go to jail, the algorithms that decide whether teachers get sacked or don't get sacked, all of these algorithms, um, it's the same thing, right? Um, I mean, they're, they're derived experimentally. There's some, there is some science in there, but there's also a norm of secrecy. These are commercially confidential. 
We're not going to share our data. We're not going to tell you exactly how the algorithm works. We're not going to subject it to a rigorous randomized trial. And for the same reason, right? We want to make money. And if we share our results with everyone, then we won't make money. So I, I look in the book at evidence on algorithms, for example, trying to test for recidivism. Like, can you predict who's going to reoffend and who isn't? The first observation, by the way, is they don't measure who reoffends; they measure who gets rearrested, which is not the same thing, right? Um, but these algorithms, they've not been properly tested. ProPublica did fantastic work trying to bring the algorithm to the surface, this confidential algorithm to show how it works. And at that point, real scientists were able to pull it apart and they reached different conclusions, but they basically said it doesn't work very well. It's got biases and it's just not very accurate. Um, that sort of transparency is absolutely essential. And that's what I think we need to demand from algorithms going forward. Like, obviously I can't understand what Google's algorithm does, but I want to know that there are experts out there that I feel I can trust who've had access and who can tell me you know, how it works, whether Facebook's recommendation engine uh, biases extremists, whether this recidivism algorithm you know, is fair and it contains no racial biases. I wanna be able to, to know that the algorithms have oversight. Um, and so there's a, lovely, there's a lovely story that I was told by um, wonderful statistician, David Spiegelhalter about a really bad algorithm in the early 1980s, there was just this clunky computer system that was designed to help doctors uh, diagnose lower abdominal pain. A non-specific lower abdominal pain could be anything from constipation to pregnancy to appendicitis to pancreatic cancer, it could be anything. And this was this old computer, well, I mean, it was brand new at the time, but these, you can imagine the capabilities of this computer sitting in the corner of an office in 1982 and the doctor's trying to tap in and the, it's all kind of white text on a black background and it, it's terrible and it makes really bad predictions. And they tested it in a randomized trial and it was great. The, the, the patients lived longer, they got better diagnoses, everything. So what happened was, well, having this bad algorithm in the corner of the office helped the doctors structure their inquiry, their thinking. And so they were actually better doctors. So it's not enough to say, is the algorithm any good or bad? You've got to see, well, how is the algorithm being used and can we test real world usage and what results it produces? Well, Tim, I wanna take this back into the realm of COVID, which has come up at least in passing. A year ago at this time, I made a bet that within, within the year, we would have at least one FDA approved vaccine in the US. And most of the epidemiologists that I spoke to said I was insane. Uh, they said, look, the fastest we've ever done this is four years. And, you know, this is actually in many ways more complex, never going to happen. And I'm like, well, should I adjust my forecast? I probably should emotionally because mm -hmm. I, you know, if, if the vaccine's not ready, I at least want to say, yeah, I won the bet yeah. uh, and, you know, and cover my emotional losses. But I was convinced that it's been a long time since we've ever had all of humanity collaborating on one big problem with this kind of focused energy. Obviously, science has advanced a lot and especially the ability to share data transparently has advanced a lot. Um, I'm now looking back and, and very tempted to say, well, look, let me rationalize my forecast because I turned out to be right. Yeah. Uh, you would be much more cautious about that. Tell me how I should analyze whether I made a good forecast there. Yeah, so I'm, I, well, I was going to ask, how, what, was the, what was the reasoning behind the forecast? That's the, that's the thing I immediately want to know. Like, what was the process that, that led you? Were you just kind of, you needed some hope? Or had you, had you talked to a whole bunch of vaccine scientists and realized that there were these breakthrough technologies out there? Uh, I, I wish I could say the latter, but no. <laughs> it, was, it was a much, um, a much more haphazard process which goes against the way that I like to do science. But it actually came from um, discounting what the epidemiologists were saying and instead going to the data on how quickly science is progressing yeah. uh, and the, you know, just the exponential change we're seeing in the production of knowledge. Um, I, I read some, um, I think it was Brian Utzi and Ben Jones research showing that the, 
both the scale and the speed of, of scientific collaboration has increased at such a rate that we can now solve problems much faster than we did before. And so I basically tried to take the, the, the time to polio vaccine and say, yeah. okay, given the advances that we've had, you know, what could we extrapolate from that? Not knowing yeah. anything about what it was gonna take to, you know, to fight COVID. That, that's, that's so interesting though, Adam, because you see, I read the Brian Jones research as being quite pessimistic about technological process, uh, progress, because the, you know, the other thing that he shows is it takes you know, longer for scientists to, to, to get to the frontier of knowledge. You know, there's just more to learn. So that they have to, they've got longer kind of pre-careers, you know, just doing the, you know, doing the groundwork before they actually make original breakthroughs. They're more specialized. Uh, you described collaboration. Well, sure, there's collaboration, but there's collaboration because there has to be, because it's all got so complicated that to get anything done requires these huge teams of these hyper-specialized people. And just the amount of the number of PhDs, the amount of money poured into just, just getting anything done, just a single paper or a single patent, just requires more and more uh, input. So I, I'm interested that you read the same research and you you came out and you said, well, this is, but this is basically a good news story. So that, I think that tells us something about the way that our um, our priors. I'm an economist, right? So we have to be dismal about this stuff. It tells us something about the way our priors. You can look at the same the same facts and come to different conclusions about them. Um, what a, what so, a wonder it is that a British economist is more pessimistic than an American psychologist. <laughs> Who would have thought? Yeah. Yeah, they, these are these are strange times indeed. Um, but but you asked how should you evaluate the uh, you know your forecast? Well, um, I mean it, it's tricky because ideally, uh, as your colleague Phil Tetlock would say, uh, you should be you know doing you should be making a hundred of these forecasts every year, and you should be keeping track of them. Uh, how many? And they should all be quantifiable. They should all have deadlines, like the one that you know you were very specific. FDA approved within a year, so that's great. Tetlock would approve, um, but you need to do a load of these, and you need to say, okay, um, ideally, all of the forecasts that I give 100% probability to, they all come true. All of the ones I give 0%, they never come true. Half of the ones I give 50-50 probability to come true, and so on and so on. And this process of keeping sc score and being really rigorous about it, um, that's, that's the, the, the first thing. And second and connected is Maria Konnikova's advice that she, as you know, she wrote this amazing book called The Biggest Bluff about taking psychology into world championship poker. And she says you need to avoid resulting. So just because your bet came out right doesn't mean your decision making process was any good you need to just forget the fact that you were right go back and say well what was i making the process in the in, in the right way was i making the decisions was i analyzing in the right way so i would say if you if you tested your ideas if you considered that you might be wrong if you uh, if you talked to people who knew something about the subject if you got those contrary opinions that's a sign that you had a good process um, sounds, sounds like your process was okay. You did at least contemplate the data and you made a specific forecast and you, you kept score. So, you know, I give you eight out of 10. <laughs> I, I want to close the gap. I want those last two points. So uh, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to go much deeper into the epidemiology next time. Uh, well, Tim, as, as we wrap up, uh, I, I think there's a follow-up question here from one of our audience members, which is, how do you think about aligning incentives to encourage this kinds of transparency and sharing in areas where it may or may not be happening, like climate change? Yeah, uh, it's a terrific question. So I, mean, I think there is, um, in, in sort of standard academic science, I think there are norms of transparency and sharing. Of course, they're sometimes you know, not respected. People are secretive about their data, but we've seen real progress in in pushing towards the fact that, uh, for example, in, in economics, you're not allowed to publish an economics paper unless your data are available, or unless you've got a really good excuse. Um, that's new. I mean, this wasn't true 10 years ago. Um, we've got more journals doing replication of other people's work. Um, there's been huge progress on this in psychology, as you, you know very well, Adam. Um, we've seen a lot of progress in medicine. So the idea that your trial in medicine has to be pre-registered, otherwise the leading medical journals won't publish it. 
Um, this again is a huge step forward in, in transparency of what people actually did and were they being honest with the data. Now, none of this is perfect. I mean, so people still get stuff published in leading medical journals, even when it, was pre, even when it wasn't pre-registered, even though the journal said they wouldn't do that, right? So there's, there's still problems, but I think we're making you know, big advances. As far as you know, what we do about Facebook, what we do about Google and these, these huge data sets, it, I mean, that's a big question. I, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a strong argument for, uh, for antitrust measures for many reasons. Um, and I should say, for, for example, uh, you know, something like Amazon, you know, it, it's, an, it's an incredible company that does incredible things for people. I mean, it's kept a lot of people going during this pandemic. Uh, it's not where I would choose to buy my books, but it's an amazing company. And you know, I think it's so amazing. I'd really like it if there were three of them. Now that's the sort of the thinking that you need. Like they, we, they need to be competing with each other rather than just this one great company sucking up all the resources. And the same thing with Google. We really need two great search engine companies. And so that's, that's a sort of a big, uh, big issue. Um, but we can demand that governments who use algorithms, who say, we are going to take the advice of an algorithm to decide where to dispatch the police. We're gonna take the advice of an algorithm to decide when a, a call comes in that says a child is in danger, um, we're gonna use an algorithm to help us decide whether it's a nuisance call, or whether it's really something that needs to be the highest priority. Um, I don't think there's anything intrinsically wrong with using algorithms to provide advice. Um, algorithms can be tested, they can be improved. Humans make mistakes as well as algorithms. But in each case, the governments who use those algorithms, they can't just take the word of companies who say, this is great stuff, you should buy our algorithm. They've got to be properly tested. They've got to insist on that. And if they're not properly tested, then we shouldn't be making these life or death decisions with them. And governments who are buying them, paying for them, they've easily got the power to, to, to insist on that. Well, I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Unless you have any doubt, our audience has too. I want to read you one comment that came in uh, from one of our attendees who says, I am not a data geek. Math terrifies me. Note, must be an American because math is singular, not plural. Take that, Tim Harford. Uh, <laughs> but this discussion is so accessible, interesting, and engaging. Thank you for sharing your natural brilliance with us, to whom this way of thinking is not intuitive at all. And Tim, I just want to echo, echo that. It is a treat to listen to you explain and ask questions and share your intellect and your curiosity with all of us. I could listen to you all day. I have actually listened to you all day when, <laughs> when binging your podcast. Uh, so anybody who hasn't listened to Cautionary Tales, highly recommend it. You will be addicted. Uh, and Tim, I, I just close by asking if we want to further our understanding of, uh, of how to get data literate. Uh, once we've read The Data Detective, where can we learn more about your work? Uh, so my website is timharford.com. Uh, I'd recommend that and the Cautionary Tales podcast. Um, or if you really want more uh, data nerdery, I have a BBC podcast called More or Less. Uh, and you can dip your toes in those particular waters. But uh, Adam, it's so kind of you to do this. Um, you really, you're a wonderful interlocutor. I feel I learn something every time I observe you in action. And I know you're super, super busy. So, so on behalf of everyone who's tuned in and on behalf of myself, th thanks, for, thanks for hosting this. It's absolutely wonderful. So happy to do it. Everyone, I want to say thank you for joining us this evening. Tim, thank you for, for enlightening us. And of course, let me close by thanking our hosts. Most importantly, Magic City, thank you for making this happen. And of course, let's support local booksellers. Thanks everyone and have a good evening, morning or afternoon, depending on the time zone you're in.